Shall we talk about the integumentary system? Oh, what the heck, let's do it. So here you see someone who's cut off his own skin. That's very interesting. It kind of creates a neat sort of costume you could wear, I guess. Um, when I teach in the classroom, I always ask if uh, anyone is willing to stick around after class, we could cut that person's skin off and take a look at it. Uh, no one has volunteered to do that, yet, but I keep telling them I'll give them an A in the class if they will. The integumentary system is the skin and its accessory structures. So accessory structures, what does that mean? Well, hair, oil glands, sweat glands, uh, pressure receptors, fingernails. All right, those are all accessory structures. It guards the body's physical and biochemical integrity. What does that mean? Well, so like if you're drunk <clears throat> and you brush up against a wall and you scrape your body, <clears throat> at least if you have skin, you only scrape your skin. Or for the skin, you would directly scrape your liver, for example, and that would be very bad. And biochemical? Well, there's lots of harmful little substances out there that would otherwise get directly into our body. Things like chemicals or bacteria or the coronavirus. So, yeah, the skin is important for keeping that stuff out. That's why you're supposed to wash your hands and not touch your face because things get on your skin. As long as they're on your skin, you're still okay. They're prevented from getting inside of your body, and as long as you wash them off, you're in pretty good shape. Helps to maintain a constant body temperature, so there's a layer of adipose tissue underneath the skin that holds heat in. And then if you get too hot, there are sweat glands in the skin, and those cool you down. You get rid of various waste products through the skin, as well as water to cool you down, of course. Also, salt and some organic waste like urea and lactic acid, that's what can make sweat a little bit stinky. Um, especially all the bacteria on the skin, they start to feed on the nutrients in the waste products and that's when sweat starts to stink. It also gives you sensory information about the outside world, so there are a variety of receptors in your skin, pain receptors, temperature receptors, pressure receptors. Um, you know, it's important for us to know what's happening around us and the skin provides part of that information. It's an important sensory uh, organ. And we make vitamin D, at least it starts in the skin. So it takes three organs, I think I mentioned before, for vitamin D, I always remember silk. Vitamin D is silky. It starts in the skin, then it continues in the liver, and then in the kidney, SLK, silk, skin, liver, kidney. Those are the three organs that help you make vitamin D. Overall anatomy of the skin, um, it is the largest of all body organs, all right? Most people don't realize that. They don't think of the skin as an organ, but it is. Um, you ask the typical person on the street, what's your largest organ? They'll say their liver or something like that. But now you'll know. So like if you're on Jeopardy, and the final Jeopardy question is, what is the largest body organ? And you'll get it right. You'll know. You'll say skin, you win $100,000, and I want 10% of that because it's because of me that you knew that, okay? Composed of all four tissue types, do you remember your tissue types? That's Bio-156, epithelial, connective, nervous, and muscular. All four of those are found in the skin. Skin is roughly two square meters. You have no damn idea how big a meter is, do you? Um, again, the U.S. and, I don't know, Burma or Suriname or someplace. The only couple of countries on the planet that don't use the metric system. But the metric system is used in science and medicine. You need to get used to that. So a meter is roughly a yard, closer to 39 inches. Um, <clears throat> get, get used to that, all right? One to four millimeters thick. Yeah, you have no damn idea how big a millimeter is, do you? When we have this uh, course, when we do it in the classroom, I ask people to show me a millimeter. And most people show me something way larger than a millimeter. Now, I was in the Boy Scouts at one point for about two weeks. I have some authority issues. We didn't get along very well. But they taught me a really good principle that I've kept with me through my life. They say, um, in order to know simple measurements, find something on your body and measure it, and then from that point on, you'll know. So I recommend go home, you know, go into your room, lock the door, you know, uh, close the drapes, take off all your clothes, and start measuring things on your body. And then you'll have a sense of what certain measurements are. So I know, for example, that on the palm of my hand, I have a line that is exactly one millimeter wide. I never have to guess at a millimeter. I have it on me. I have another line on my palm that's two millimeters wide. My index fingernail is one centimeter wide. My thumb is five centimeters, or two inches. The last segment of my little finger is one inch. My cubit 
from the tip of my elbow to the tip of my middle finger is 50 centimeters, almost exactly. So I have my own measuring stick. And my middle finger is almost exactly 10 uh, centimeters in length. So uh, I love to teach other people the metric system. Sometimes somebody cuts me off in traffic, I pull up alongside of them at the next stop sign and I show them my middle finger and I encourage them to learn the metric system. I say, you, this is 10 centimeters, learn your metric system. I don't know why, they don't seem appreciative of that. Skin weighs four and a half kilograms, that's roughly 10 pounds. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> so let's look at the overall structure of the skin and the subcutaneous layer. We talk about them all together. The superficial portion of the skin is the epidermis. It's composed of epithelial tissue. How easy is that? Epidermis, epithelial. Epi, remember, means on top of. So epidermis means on top of the skin. So the epidermis is the outermost layer of your skin. It's epithelial tissue. The deeper layer is called the dermis, and that's mostly connective tissue, all right? I like to ask this on exams and quizzes. I think it's important to have an idea of that because the epithelial tissue is easily shed and you don't really care if you lose it, whereas the dermis is a bigger deal. Underneath the dermis is the subcutaneous layer, and nurses use, a, they love to have little nicknames and cool code words, they call it sub-Q. Um, it's technically called the hypodermis, look, hypo under dermis, the skin. It's technically not a part of the skin. So why are we talking about it? Well, because when we talk about the skin, we want to know um, <clears throat> what's what's around it. We want. I don't want you to leave you just with the skin. I want you to know what comes next. So, for example, if you were like Aaron Ralston, that was the guy who hiked Blue John Canyon, which I've been to, by the way, the Slot Canyon, and uh, he had to cut off his own arm because it was a trap uh, pinned by a boulder. Um, as you cut off your own arm, I would expect you to know exactly what you're cutting through. All right. So first would be epidermis, then dermis, then hypodermis then would come muscle, and then would come, well, there, uh, yeah, muscle, and then would be the nerves and the blood vessels, and then finally bone, okay? So, um, Aaron Ralston was that guy's name. I read his book. They made that movie, too, with James Franco. I can't even remember the name of the movie now. But, um, at any rate, yeah, so the hypodermis is actually part of your muscular tissue. It's what we'll see later. It's called the superficial fascia. So, don't fall for it if I say true or false, the epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis form the skin. No, false. The epidermis is not, hypodermis, sorry, is not part of your skin. It's part of your muscle tissue. It's underneath. It's got all that adipose that helps hold your heat in. So yeah, areolar, adipose, connective tissue. That should ring a bell from Bio 156. It's an area for fat storage um, where you store energy. Remember triglycerides in the adipose tissue? It's where blood vessels are, where nerve endings are, pressure sensing nerve endings. Um, and like I mentioned before, it helps retain heat and stabilize your body temperature, okay? Now then, overviews of the epidermis. The epidermis is made of stratified squamous epithelium, and that should ring a bell from Bio 156. Stratified means it's in layers. Squamous, it's tough stuff. It's kind of scaly, tough stuff, all right? It's avascular. Again, prefixes, root word, suffixes. A or an usually means without. Vascular means blood vessels. So what does avascular mean? It means it has no blood vessels. So again, if you're drunk and you scrape up against the wall and you see a big scrape on your arm but there's no blood, that means you didn't even go through your epidermis. You need to try harder. So when you scrape yourself and you actually see little bits of blood, that means you made it all the way through the epidermis into your dermis. And by the way, you can see in the upper left and upper right uh, diagrams, nice, on the left is the cartoon, on the right is an actual photomicrograph of your skin. So you can see there are different layers, all right, and there are other cells embedded within. We're going to know all about those, okay? There are five kinds of cells, including stem cells, and there are five distinct, st distinct strata or layers. So five and five, five cells, five strata. All right, let's start zooming in and taking a look at what those things are. Five principal cells of the epidermis. First is a keratinocyte. This makes up by far most of your epidermis. Remember, site means cell. Keratin is a protein. Remember, proteins, they're the structure of your body and they're also the workers. 
Um, so keratin is a very tough protein. It's widely found throughout nature wherever you need a tough protective layer. And that's what the outside of our skin is, our epidermis. It's a tough protective layer. So keratinocytes make keratin, helps protect the skin, and protects you from bacteria and chemicals and viruses and so on. Keeps them outside of your body, prevents them from getting in. Good thing. Also it produces lamellar granules which contain a waterproof sealant. They're lipids here. They make your skin relatively waterproof or water resistant. Otherwise, every time you jumped into the swimming pool, you would swell up like the Pillsbury Doughboy or like the Michelin Tire Man. Um, you would soak up all that water. So, no, the skin helps uh, water from getting in. It's a barrier to you absorbing water. Again, keratinocytes make up by far most of the epidermis. Then there are melanocytes. So again, site, cell, melanin is a pigment. So melanocytes are cells that make the pigment melanin. They are 10 to 25% of the epidermal cells in the base layer. Now that's not 10 to 25% of the entire epidermis. That's just 10 to 25% of the base layer, which is only one cell thick. So overall melanocytes make up only a tiny fraction of a percent of your overall epidermis. But they're nonetheless important because they secrete melanin and that contributes to your skin color. It also absorbs damaging ultraviolet light. So ultraviolet light can actually damage your chromosomes and cause cancer. So the whole idea of getting a tan, um, you think, ooh, I'm gonna get a tan, I'm gonna look so great, have my beach body, well, yeah, fine. But what's really going on when you see yourself getting a tan, your skin is basically saying, oh my God, look at all this UV light. We don't want to get cancer. And so it's trying to make melanin to prevent you from getting cancer. Melanin is packaged into little packages called melanosomes, which are released and taken up by keratinocytes. So we'll take a look at that next. Keratin, by the way, where do you find keratin in nature? Oh my gosh, where don't you find it? Animal claws, tough, hard things for ripping flesh apart if you're a bird of prey. Um, scales of reptiles, that's a picture of a rattlesnake that I took myself. Is that beautiful or what? Um, so yeah, scales are keratin. Your fingernails are made of keratin. Horses hooves are made of keratin. Feathers are made of keratin. Rhinoceros horns are keratin. Keratin also is the outer layer on cow horns. And your hair is made of keratin. So keratin is tough stuff. It's protective stuff. And it aligns your epidermis, it's what your epidermis is composed of, um, so that it will protect you from damage from the outside world. And here you see a melanocyte, um, looks like an octopus there at the bottom. Those little black spots are little granules of melanin, the pigment. And then notice on the far right and on the far left, you can see those tentacles pinching off little blobs, and then you can see the blobs floating up. So those are the keratinocytes that you see up above, all those cells, and they are taking up the melanosomes. And that's what gives you a tan. As more and more of your keratinocytes absorb these little blobs of these little melanosomes, these blobs of melanin, that's what gives you your tan. Continuing then with the five principal cells of the epidermis, we have dendritic cells. They used to be called Langerhans cells, and I don't even remember. I've looked it up before and I can't remember. I think it was probably Dr. Langerhans who first noticed them. Dendritic cell, uh, by the way, Langerhans, that name is out. All eponyms are officially out in science and medicine. Eponyms means a name named after a person. Those were bad because they don't tell you much about the cell. So we're replacing all the eponyms with descriptive names that tell you about the cell. So dendritic cells are actually extremely important. We talk about them a lot in Bio 202. We won't talk about them much again in Bio 201, but remember these, they're a big deal in Bio 202. They are a type of antigen presenting cell, an APC. They're macrophages that wander through your body and they eat bad guys, pathogen. Pathos, disease, gen, create. Pathogens are things that create disease, like bacteria and viruses and things like that. So antigen presenting cells wander around through your body, they gobble up bad guys, and then they take a piece of the bad guy and they display it on the surface of the cell. And they display that to a T helper cell, 
and then the T helper cell looks at it and either says, okay, no big deal, this is just a normal thing, or the T helper says, oh my golly, this is a bad thing, and then the T helper cell alerts the entire immune system, and your immune system jumps into action, and you mobilize the troops and the Navy SEALs and the helicopters and the F-15s, and you go out and you kill the bad guys, okay? So the guy who first figured out what dendritic cells uh, did, he just got the Nobel Prize in medicine uh, a little while back, because dendritic cells turned out to be a huge deal in terms of your immune system, so keep that in mind. They come from the bone marrow like all white blood cells do. They're basically a type of macrophage. Then there are tactile cells. They used to be called Merkel cells. And they have a little structure called a tactile disc. It used to be called a Merkel disc. They're involved in the sensation of pressure. They're right up at the dermal epidermal junction. So they're right at the boundary between your dermis and your epidermis. You have a lot of different pressure receptors in your skin. We'll be talking about more of them. But they have different specialties. So these tactile cells are for light touch. There are other cells deeper down in the dermis that are for deep pressure. There are other kinds of cells that detect vibration. So it's important to know what's happening around you, what's touching your body. So you have a variety of receptors that tell you that. This is the first one we're looking at, a tactile cell. Then there are the stem cells. Remember what makes stem cells special? They can divide to make more of themselves, but they can also divide to make other things. So embryonic stem cells can divide to make any kind of cell in your body. That's why researchers want them so badly. They really hold the secret of life itself. Adult stem cells can only usually make one or two other things. And in this case, the stem cells you find in the epidermis make keratinocytes and melanocytes, which are the two really important cells of the epidermis. So there you go. We've looked at the five uh, cells of the epidermis. And next we're going to start zooming in and looking at the five distinct strata or layers.